Chapter 16 My initial image of the underground was pure fantasy. When Zaid talked about the underground, I actually pictured people in some basement passing through some hidden bookcase door and disappearing into thin air. I had pictured all kinds of elaborate I spy kinds of hookups, outrageous disguises, false panels, stuff right out of Mission Impossible. I was shocked when I ran into a brother I knew in a supermarket. I knew the pigs were looking for him. He had shaved all the hair off his face, but he looked almost the same. I had to catch myself to keep from calling out to him. I just kept walking, feeling that somehow seeing me would make him nervous. Even though I had always thought that someday I'd probably be involved in clandestine struggle, I had never given any serious thoughts to going underground. I had more or less thought of a clandestine struggle in terms of leading a double life. I thought the ideal way to struggle was to have a regular job or whatever as a front and then go out at night or whenever and do what needed to be done, careful to leave no trails. I still think that this is the best way, but you have to anticipate being discovered and be prepared for whatever might happen. At the end of the 60s or the beginning of the 70s, it seemed like people were going underground left and right. Every other week I was hearing about somebody disappearing. Police repression had come down so hard on the black movement that it seemed as if the entire black community was on the FBI's most wanted list. The repression had come down so fast that many people had no choice whatsoever to get organized. I was kind of in limbo, slipping back and forth between above and below. As far as I could tell, I was only wanted for questioning. I hadn't done anything and I didn't feel that the situation was too grave. I had to be discreet and change some of my habits, but I felt relatively free to move around above ground and underground without too much problem. I had no intentions of answering anybody's questions, and so I figured I'd just lay low until the heat was over. There were so many things that needed to be done. Basically, I was working with the railroad support network, stations, trying to find the basic necessities for people and trying to help them get to where they wanted to go. It was a job that required real caution and a lot of concentration on detail. Over a short period of time, I found that my powers of observation had increased many times over. I had to keep my eyes on everything that was going on looking ahead and, at the same time, glancing over my shoulder. The work was interesting and well-suited to my restless, active temperament, but I found it kind of hard to change my way of relating to people. I had always been open and trusting, and I was finding it really hard to change. It took my almost getting killed for me to develop a more suspicious nature. I was running into quite a few people, some of whom I knew and others whom I didn't. Different collectives, members of different organizations from different parts of the country. I was surprised at how disorganized many people were, and I was all for seeing them organize themselves in a much more disciplined manner. I was straining to understand some of the things I saw but people were moving so fast, it was hard to keep track of what they were doing. The whole situation was new to me, and I guess all of us were trying to make heads or tails out of it, trying to get a good grip on what was happening and where we fit into it. 
I had heard it on the radio, had seen some of the reports on TV. My reaction was, wow, the tables were turning. As many black people as the New York Police Department murdered every year, someone was finally paying them back. The media were filled with countless adjectives, senseless, brutal, vicious, deadly, bloody, etc. On May 19th, Malcolm X's birthday, two police had been machine gunned on River Riverside Drive. I felt sorry for their families, sorry for their children, but I was relieved to see that somebody else besides black folks and Puerto Ricans and Chicanos was being shot at. I was sick and tired of us being the only victims, and I didn't care who knew it. As far as I was concerned, the police in the black communities were nothing but a foreign occupying army, beating, torturing, and murdering people at whim and without restraint. I despise violence, but I despise it even more when it's one-sided and used to oppress and repress poor people. But I was still in a state of shock the shit was so real. I mean, it was happening. Somebody was doing what the rest of us merely had fantasies about. I had an early morning meeting. My friend went to the corner to pick up the papers and something to munch on. He came back all excited. Look at this, sister. I think you should look at this. I don't want to look at anything right now. I want something to eat. What did you buy to eat? This is serious, sister. Will you come over and look at this? Man, I don't want to read no paper. I'm starving, I said. Nevertheless, I went over and picked up the papers. Oh shit. Oh shit was the only thing that would come out of my mouth. Hungrily, I read every word of the article. I stared down at my picture on the front page of the Daily News. The paper said I was wanted for questioning in relation to the machine gunning. Shit! I walked aimlessly around in circles. I couldn't believe it, but I was looking at it. You've got to get out of here, sister, my friend said. Where am I supposed to go? I don't know, but we've got to get you out of here. Maybe you can go and hook up with the people. I knew that I had to hook up with some people in the underground, but this was no time to go around hunting for people. Strangely enough, I felt calm and I wanted to stay that way. I asked my friend to go and get me a wig and some other things to enable me to move around a little bit. While he went to get the things I needed, I went through my address book and made mental notes of the people who the pigs could easily trace me to. I had to stifle the desire to call my mother and tell her that, at least for the moment, I was relatively safe and that I loved her. Once I got out into the street, I could feel the tension in my body. I walked down the street searching for signs on people's faces. I walked a few blocks before I realized that not a soul in the world was paying me any mind. I heard some feet running behind me and swung around, only to find it was a bunch of children. I had planned to go to my girlfriend's house and decided I'd still head that way. She lived alone in a quiet neighborhood and I knew that it would be damn near impossible for anyone to trace me to her. Her life consisted almost completely of working and going to school at night. I was a little nervous when I got to her door. Maybe I was doing the wrong thing, getting her hooked into all of this. Maybe she would be angry at me for coming at all. I decided that I wouldn't stay. I would just stop by to explain to her why I was late and to tell her goodbye. She answered the door with a towel wrapped around her head. 
What the hell took you so long? How do I begin? A funny thing happened to me on the way to your house. There's something I've got to tell you, I began. I just stopped by to say goodbye. The police are looking for me. My picture is plastered all over the daily news. I don't believe this is happening, but it is. I know, I know, she told me. What I want to know is, what took you so long to get here? I stared at her, completely surprised. I didn't understand. If she knew what happened, why was she expecting me? I just dropped by for a minute to let you know what happened and to let you know that I'm okay. Are you okay? I told her that I was. Where are you going? I told her that I was going to try to hook up with some people I knew. Where do you have to go? Do you have any money? Do you know how to contact these people? Do you need any help? I told her that I had just found out what was happening and that I was just going to have to play it by ear, slipping and sliding for a while until I could make contact. Girl, are you crazy? You militants ain't got no sense. Would you take that shit off your head and sit down so I can talk to you? She always referred to me and my comrades as you militants. She was a militant too, but at the moment she was not active, not out on front street, as she called it. Do you have this address written down anywhere or this phone number? No, nobody even knows who you are or that we even know each other. Luckily, I had never made a habit of writing too much down, and since things had gotten so hot, I had put most of the numbers that I had for contacts in code. I knew all of my friends' numbers by heart, so that was no problem. I had never even called her from the 138th Street phone at my last place. I told her that as far as I knew, there was no way I could be traced to her. Then relax, fool. It don't make no sense for you to be out there in the street moving around right now. You've got to relax and get your head together. Look, I told her, I don't want to impose on you. This is my thing, not yours, and I don't want to involve you in my stuff. Woman, will you please shut up? This ain't your thing, this is our thing. You didn't involve me in it already. And if I didn't want to be bothered, I wouldn't have opened my door. I'm your friend, and I trust you and love you. I'll hide you out any old time. Where did you think you were going to hide out anyway? On the moon? I stared at her in amazement. I had never really known her. A real sister. Tough, critical, a bit too cynical but a real stand-up woman. Here, she said, handing me a knife and some onions and potatoes. Make yourself useful. Even y'all militants got to eat. I just sat there grinning, grinning and peeling potatoes, talking and feeling really at home. It's early in the morning. I have to move. The move has got to be made with care since my picture has just been plastered all over the newspapers. Wanted posters of me are everywhere. And somebody had told me that the police have a photograph of me in the space over the glove compartments of their cars. Carefully, I arrange my disguise. It has been designed not to stand out something that will help me blend in with the other people who will be on the subway early in the morning. I stare at myself in the mirror, debating whether to look like a secretary or a maid. It's too early in the morning for secretaries. I decide to look like a poor black woman. Thick, ugly stockings, run over black Oxfords, beat up plastic pocketbook, hand-me-down looking plaid jacket, and 
Of course, Lord have mercy looking wig. My puffy morning face smudged with a dab of awkward looking eyebrow pencil and lipstick are perfect for the look. I walk down to the subway, stopping to buy the paper. I stand on the platform, waiting for the train. I thumb the newspapers, making sure that no familiar photographs appear. I skim the headlines to find the usual assortment of right-wing half-lies, distortions, and scandal stories. The headlines, as usual, are offensive. Commies land in outer space. Cops nab light bulb bandit. Hubby ties knot with country gal. Finally, the train comes. I scan the cars as they pass, looking for the transit cop. Seeing none, I move toward the front of the train. I plop down in a vacant seat and immediately stick my head into the newspaper. Carefully, I look around to see who is riding the car with me. In an instant, I'm reproaching myself for leaving too early in the morning. I have an eerie feeling that something is wrong, but I can't put my finger on it. The subway car has a twilight zone air to it. With the exception of a few white men who look like they are going to factory jobs, the rest are black women. One has on a nurse's uniform. Another looks like she is going to church, hat and all. And the rest of them look more or less like me. I keep staring at them and it registers. Without one exception, Every one of these sisters is wearing a wig. It feels so spooky. I am hiding my beautiful nappy hair under this wig and hating it. Hiding my stuff to save my life. I who have had to give up my head wraps and my big beaded earrings, my dungaree jackets, my red, black and green poncho, and my long African dresses in order to struggle on another level. Look out from under my wig at my sisters. Maybe we are all running and hiding. Maybe we are all running from something, all living a clandestine existence. Surely we are all being oppressed and persecuted. I imagine the headlines, nigger woman nabbed for nappy hair, Afro gal has tangled hair, militant mom bears all. It is really too much to comprehend. Such horrible things have been done to us. A whole generation of black women hiding out under dead white people's hair. I have the urge to cry but I don't. It would draw attention. I keep from getting up until my stop comes. I pray and struggle for the day when we can all come out from under these wigs. Current events. I understand that I am slightly out of fashion. The in crowd wants no part of me. Someone said that I am two sixties, black. Someone else told me I had failed to mellow. It is true, I have not straightened back my hair, nor rediscovered Maybelline. And it is also true that I still like African things like statues and dresses and people. And it is also true that struggle is foremost in my mind and I still rap about discipline. My anger has not run away. 
And I still can't stand old El Dorado. And I still can't dig no one and one. And I still don't dig no Rockefellers. And I call a pig a pig and a party to my thinking. Happens only once in a while. Anyway, I'm really kind of happy being slightly out of style.